Section 8 of The Strange Visitation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elise Black, Atlanta, Georgia. The Strange Visitation by Marie Corelli. Out into the storm again on the wings of the bitter winter wind. All the sunshine of the spiritual climate vanished and a great panorama of dark clouds moved rapidly through the freezing air clouds everywhere clouds of fantastic form and giant shape clouds like rocky fortresses set on the summits of high mountains clouds resembling huge ruminative animals wallowing in ether clouds heavy and threatening suggesting pent-up thunder and jagged flame like a couple of midges the goblin and its human victim were tossed from edge to edge of the thick rolling vapors and when they descended to earth once more josiah mcnason found himself in the small best parlor of an unpretentious residence one in a row of similar dwellings in an unpretentious street keep your eyes open mcnason said the goblin and your ears nobody sees you you know or me we're invisible and if you want to curse and swear do so by all means nobody hears and nobody cares josiah looked and saw before him a man reclining in an invalid chair near a small bright fire his eyes fixed on the sparkling flames with a patient and wistful sadness a pale sweet-faced woman with soft brown hair somewhat silvered knelt by him clasping one of his hands tenderly in her own there were traces of tears on her worn thin cheeks and her lips quivered and standing close by with one arm resting on the mantelpiece and eyes bent compassionately down upon the pair was another man whom mcnason had no difficulty in recognizing as his overseer mr pitt yet his surprise at this was so great that he could not forbear an exclamation pitt here how the devil exactly said the goblin how the devil and why the devil only the devil knows josiah groaned and then the overpowering dumbness that had seized him before caught him again in its paralyzing power stricken mute himself he was nevertheless forced to listen with the closest attention to all that passed around him and when pitt spoke the sound of that equable familiar voice sent a new and violent shock through his already racked nervous system mr mcnason is a man of iron said pitt there's no doubt about it in fact he's harder than any metal for metal can be made to melt and he can't the man in the invalid chair moved restlessly did he remember me at all did you remind him he murmured yes willie i did i even recalled the days when you used to carry his little son on your shoulder round to see the works and i said dove was one of the smartest men in your employ and brought valuable custom to the firm but it was all no use no use he paused and then addressed himself gently to the woman who knelt by her husband's side i am sure mrs dove you believe that i have done my best indeed indeed i know you have she answered earnestly and after all i never had much hope mr mcnason must have endless claims upon his purse and memory it is so seldom one finds a very very rich man who cares to help little outside troubles like ours here her voice trembled dangerously and she ceased willie dove sighed a little wearily ah oh, well he said i did my best for him in my day and i thought he might possibly be disposed to do me a good turn now it's true i haven't so many years before me but i've got some working power left if i could only get well i'm afraid it's my fault will said his wife piteously you could of course go to the hospital and doctors would attend to you there but oh i couldn't bear it i couldn't bear it and here her self-control gave way and she began to sob i couldn't bear to see you taken away from me after all the years we have spent so happily together i couldn't bear to think of you ill and in a place where i could only get at you at stated times with strangers always about you it is very foolish of me and perhaps very wrong but i i cannot help it 
Her husband stroked her bent head with his thin, delicate hand. Don't cry, Jenny, he said softly. I won't go away from you. I'd rather die. Mr. Pitt coughed obstreperously. Look here, Dove, he said. Don't let us be miserable on Christmas Eve. I left McNason himself looking as wretched as a plucked crow. Poor old chap. With all his money, I wouldn't be in his shoes for the world. Tell me, what did the doctor say when he saw you today? About the same as he has always said, replied Dove resignedly, that an operation would not only relieve but cure me, and that he should like to perform it here in my own house, and get a good surgical nurse to attend upon me with my wife's assistance. For my wife is a capital nurse, aren't you, Jenny? He caressed the bent head again and went on. He thinks me of too nervous a temperament to do well away from home. There followed a silence. Presently Pitt spoke again in determined accents. I tell you what it is, Dove, he said. I'll lend you the money. Dove started. You, Mr. Pitt? Yes, I. And Pitt, smiling, drew himself up with an air of resolution. I can't afford it a bit, but I'll risk it. I'll risk it because, well, because it's Christmas time. Now don't try to get up. For Dove, raising himself in his chair with some difficulty, caught at Pitt's hand and grasped it hard, while tears stood in his eyes. And don't thank me, because I can't bear to be thanked. It's Christmas time, as I've said, and I've always had old-fashioned ideas of Christmas. My mother taught them to me. God bless her, I think, and his voice sank a little, that perhaps we ought to spare a little gold frankincense and myrrh, just at this season and this loan to you will be my thank-offering. Though it's a poor thing at best, for you see, I can't give you the money, Willie. McNason could have given it and never have missed it, but I can't. I wish I could. However, if you'll take the will for the deed— And now Mrs. Dove, rising gently from her knees, came up to him and laid her hand on his arm. God bless you, Mr. Pitt, she said in her clear, sweet tones. He will bless you. Be sure of that. What you lend to us is more than given, because you have such a friendly sympathy with us, and sympathy is greater than gold. I will not even try to thank you. No, don't, interrupted Pitt hastily, pressing her hand hard. It's it's all right. Dev and I will arrange our business matters, and I'll see the doctor tomorrow, even though it is Christmas Day. I'll pay it all back, said Dove excitedly. I can work well still. I've got all my wits about me. And I have a fine offer from a firm to undertake some affairs for them immediately, if I can only pull up my strength. And I think I shall manage now. Pitt here drew a chair to the fire opposite the sick man and sat down. It's a curious thing, he said, how the possession of enormous wealth hardens some people and makes them not only difficult to deal with, but often positively cruel to themselves and to others. Now, if one is to judge by outward looks, Mr. McNason, though a multimillionaire, is just about one of the most miserable men alive. The goblin chuckled and gave Josiah a nudge with its sharp elbow. Hear that, McNason, it said. It'll do you good to learn what other folks think of you. So old, so feeble, and so lonely, went on Mr. Pitt almost pathetically. When he refused to do anything for your assistance, Dove, I was inclined to be very plain-spoken, and give him a bit of my mind, even at the risk of offending him. But seeing what a forlorn old wreck he seemed, with his shriveled body and wrinkled face, I thought it was no use being angry with him, especially at Christmas time. He's not long for this world. Again the goblin nudged Josiah's arm, and its fiery eyes glowed with railway signal brilliancy. It's not exactly age that will kill him, went on Pitt meditatively. He's not seventy yet, and ought to look much healthier and stronger than he does. My father is eighty-two, and is as well set up a veteran as anyone could wish to see, walks at six miles a day, and as young as heart as a boy. But, of course, he has always lived a very simple life, and never hankered after more money than just as much would keep him going and save him from debt. Mr. McNason has all the cares of an immense business on his brain, and naturally a breakdown must come sooner or later— he ceased. A gust of wind roared down the chimney, throwing the flames of the little fire crookedly to and fro. Mrs. Dove shivered and looked about her uneasily. "'What a stormy night,' she said. "'Not at all a peaceful Christmas.' Her husband, lying restfully back in his chair, smiled at her. "'The peace must be in our hearts, Jinny,' he said. "'If we don't keep Christmas there, it's no Christmas at all. 
Storm or calm, it's a blessed time, a time of thanksgiving, a time of hope. So it is, agreed Pitt, and so may it always be. Now, Mrs. Dove, bring out a bottle of that old port your good doctor sent me the other day, and we'll drink to Willie's recovery and health and general usefulness. And we'll wish old McNason a Merry Christmas, too. They all laughed, and Mrs. Dove set the whining glasses on the table. Mr. Pitt poured out the ruby-red cordial and, raising his own glass to his lips, said, A Merry Christmas to you, Mrs. Dove. A Merry Christmas to you, Willie. And to our grim and gaunt old governor, Mr. McNason, a Merry Christmas also. And may he find something better than riches in the next world and be all the happier for the finding. They all three drank this toast, and while they drank, Josiah and McNason trembled in every limb with an ague of exceeding cold. Was he so near death, he wondered, that even Pitt could see the near approach of his end? He turned his miserable eyes upon the goblin who grinned. Brother Firebrand was quite right, you see, it remarked. Soon, very soon, you will be one of us. We are your next world, you know, and riches don't count in our United Empire Club. Oh, you'll be happy, McNason. Oh, yes, You'll be so happy because you will have reaped the just reward of your labors, and you will be exactly what you have made of yourself. Nothing could be more satisfactory. Listen, Willie Dove is talking about you now. And so he was. Willie Dove was speaking in the kindest and gentlest way possible of the man who had refused to help him in his need. Well, I hope Mr. McNason will live many years yet, he said and that he will learn how to enjoy and get the best out of the large fortune he has made. The amount of good he could do if he liked is simply incalculable, and if he would only use some of his money just for the sole purpose of benefiting others, and would not merely put it out like a magnet to draw more money in again, he would be the happiest man alive. For instance, if instead of subscribing large sums to charities, which are presided over by committees who use up half the money for their own expenses, he would go himself among the poor, and personally relieve them at first hand. If he would try to help those who are with great difficulty, trying to help themselves, those who cannot borrow and will not beg, if he would just put himself out a bit, and that's just what he won't do, interposed Pitt. He can't see anything or anybody but himself. That's the pity of it. Poor soul, said Mrs. Dove gently. We mustn't forget that he lost his only son a dear little boy, and that may have embittered him. All our children have been mercifully spared to us, thank God. But even if one had been taken, I'm sure we should always have been thinking of that one. And his one was his all. We must remember that. And however hard he is upon us, we mustn't be hard upon him. That wouldn't be keeping Christmas rightly." At this Josiah turned and flung himself desperately against the goblin's paunch. "'Take me away,' he muttered, finding his speech with an effort. "'Take me out of this. I don't want to stop here. I want to get away. Quick!' "'Coals of fire, eh?' said the goblin. "'A trifle scorching even on a thick skull like yours, McNeeson. So you'd forgotten Willie Dove, had you? Curious. He was always a very excellent fellow, though—' and one of the best men in your employ. The honor of the firm was the first thing with him at all times, and you owe to his hard work and straight principles more than you have the honesty to acknowledge. But it's no use trying to tip the balance of things, McNeeson. That balance always rights itself. Good is good, and evil is evil. You can't make one out to be the other, however much you try. If you're spiteful, if you're mean, if you're unthankful for the blessings bestowed on you and more than all, if you refuse to help those who have helped you, you are punished. You are, really. And a good sound flogging you get, I can tell you. Oh, Beelzebub, don't I know this? When I was a church warden, will you do as I ask you, implored Josiah desperately. Get me out of this. I want to go home. Poor old baby wants to go home, does it? jeered the goblin. Oh, but it mustn't be naughty. It must go where its nursey takes it. Just another little righty-pighty in its coachy-pochy. And rising aloft on its skeleton toes, the goblin grew larger and more threatening of aspect, while its bat wings slowly unfurling seemed spreading out so darkly and interminably that Josiah fell on his knees in terror. 
Just another taste of the supernatural, McNeeson. Just another little experience of Hell's United Empire Club. No, no, gasped the trembling millionaire. Let me get home. Give me a chance to... to... His voice gurgled away into a faint tremolo. Chance? You've had a thousand chances, retorted the goblin scornfully, and you've thrown them all away. Now you're asking for one chance? Oh, hooroo! Come and see how Christians love one another, with a love that perhaps you may appreciate because it is so like hate. Come and hear an ordained clerical Judas deny his master. You and such men as you, gorged with gold and diseased with self, are chiefly to blame for the wicked blasphemies which today brand the Christian world with infamy. Come! Come! Blasphemy will suit you. You have aided it and abetted it many a time, even though you are a church warden. Oh, hooroo! Hooroo! Come in the spirit of 1 Timothy 2. Come! 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 And like a great phantom of black night descending, the goblin swooped upon Josiah once more. The little quiet room where Willie Dove, his wife, and friend were all cheerily drinking. A Merry Christmas was blotted from his sight, and again limitless space enshrouded and enveloped him in darkness. End of Section 8 Recording by Elise Black, Atlanta, Georgia Section Number 9 of the Strange Visitation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elise Black, Atlanta, Georgia. The Strange Visitation by Marie Corelli. A muffled and monotonous sound of chanting, the twinkling of many bright lights, and the subdued, rustling movement of many people gathered together. These were the next impressions that awakened McNason to renewed consciousness. He stood in what seemed a shadowy forest of architecture. There were great marble monuments all around him, inscribed with the names of famous poets, warriors, and historians. And on one of these the goblin squatted cross-legged beside him, blinking with its owl-like eyes. "'There's not a sea to be had, McNason,' it remarked with a leer. "'You must stand.' "'Oh, Beelzebub, what a thing it is to be a fashionable preacher. "'Nothing draws so well nowadays as an atheist in holy orders, "'not even a reverend brother firebrand. "'Oh, hooroo!' "'McNason looked bewilderedly about him. "'Surely he knew the place he was in. "'Its blackened arches, its shadowy aisles were not wholly unfamiliar.' Gradually he recognized it as that melancholy Valhalla of English departed greatness, Westminster Abbey. But why had his uncanny incubus, Professor Goblin, brought him hither? What had he to do with the dense crowd of people massed round him, all looking, all listening? Hush! The monotonous chanting ceased. There was a brief pause of pretense at prayer, and then a man's voice, clear and incisive, but with a falsetto ring of cold superciliousness and irony in its tone, sounded vibratingly on the silence. The church's ordained preacher of the gospel began to preach, and Josiah McNason, more than any other human unit in the congregation, was compelled to listen. And as he listened, he became aware that this same ordained preacher was calmly, but none the less surely, doing his best to undermine the very faith of which he was a professed disciple. Craftily, and with cunningly devised arguments which held their meaning deftly secreted under a veil of choice, expressions, and well-turned phrases, he spoke of old beliefs, with delicate tolerance and compassion, throwing in occasional questionings as to the meaning of miracles, and setting down divine interposition as a fable, or rather as a beautiful myth which in the darker ages of the world was eminently useful as a means of intimidating and chastening the spirits of the ignorant. He spoke much of a new feeling, which was awakening among more advanced and civilized humankind, that special new feeling which looks upon man as in himself supreme, and answerable to no higher tribunal than his own for his actions. He deprecated the unfortunately chaotic state of things in the churches, which prevented a full inquiry into the foundations of belief, 
and hoped that the time was fast approaching when a larger and broader view might be obtained and humanity be absolved from special duties to a supernatural conception which might possibly be a mistaken conception after all in fine the drift of his involved and euphistic eloquence was to imply that pygmy man would in due course be permitted to fathom the mind of god and not only be permitted to fathom it but to criticize it question it and possibly condemn it after the same easy style and in the same casual fashion in which all humans criticism condemns what is too limited to comprehend and gradually it was forced in upon josiah mcnason's not always receptive intelligence that the rankest hearsay the vilest blasphemy was being preached from a christian pulpit by one who passing for a christian minister was nothing more nor less than a foul hypocrite and a disgrace to his sacred calling yet the congregation listened they did not rise at once and make a quiet exit as they should have done had they been honest and brave had they truly loved the faith which leads to heaven yet their faces expressed a certain dull bewilderment some looked worried and sad others perplexed though many of them appeared indifferent and certain words which he had heard often yet which he had scarcely heeded while hearing them came ringing across mcnason's mind as clearly as though they had just been spoken into his ears and because iniquity shall abound the love of many shall wax cold he trembled his eyes were dim but he could still see the atheist preacher's cold intellectual face he was still in a vague way conscious that the sermon was going on and that a human creature full to the very brows of self-sufficiency and conceit was presuming to lay down the law concerning the possible limitations of the divine a human creature moreover who occupied his very position in the church through having solemnly sworn fidelity to the master who now by the most covert subterfuges and sophistries he was denying and he was aware that a sense of uneasiness and discomfort affected nearly all present including himself he turned to look at the goblin but to his amazement it had disappeared was he free then free once more to go where he liked and do as he liked he tried to move but his feet seemed fastened to the earth with iron weights he essayed to speak but his tongue refused to obey the impulse of his brain oh still on the voice of the atheist preacher in england's ancient abbey flowed with that equable fluency which comes of long and careful elocutionary practice and josiah mcnason wedged as he was into the close pressing crowd wondered how long he would have to stand there listening to what at another more convenient time he might very likely have considered a clever and up-to-date expression of the new feeling all at once he saw a great light like that of the sun at noonday suddenly begin to shine with glorious effulgence it formed into a halo of exceeding brilliancy spreading from north to south from east to west of the old church between the choir and the nave and with a palpitating dread shaking his very soul josiah watched it widening and ever widening till taking upon itself the shape of a cross it fired the whole scene with the radiance of a golden morning yet no one saw it apparently no one save he the world's great millionaire who denying the supernatural was for the time under supernatural sway and trembling he beheld that wondrous cross move mysteriously forward till its light poured with a gracious beauty and beneficence over all the dull worn faces of the people on men and women and children alike though as it moved it left the face of the atheist preacher covered with darkness and in the very heart and centre of its environment lustre a majestic figure paced slowly a godlike man whose features were sorrowful and whose brow was crowned with thorns a faint whisper floated on the air like a sigh of small spirit voices in plaintive unison despised and rejected love divine and human love perfect and eternal despised and rejected even now down down on his knees fell the man of many millions overcome by the most poignant fear and shame he had ever known he had disbelieved he knew it at last 
he knew that he had, for the sake of public conventionality, made more hypocritical pretense to worship one whose sublime teaching he outraged every day of his life, whose commands he ignored, and whose example he had never at any time tried to follow. And now, now, with pulses beating as though they would burst and eyes dim with painful tears wrung from the center of the rocky region of his heart, he sought to cover his face, but was forced against his will to gaze, half blind and giddy, as he was on the majestic advancing shape, which appeared to draw away all the shadows of the great cathedral and transfuse them into light. He noticed with an extraordinary anguish, which to him was as new as it was keen, that the crowded congregation of people among whom he knelt seemed totally unaware of the shining presence that passed them by, and as that presence moved slowly and silently towards the closed doors of the abbey, he felt that he must cry out wildly, Look! Look! Kneel down and pray, entreat him not to leave us, for if he goes, why should we remain? But all utterance was denied him. He could only watch and tremble. Slowly, very slowly, with a grand reproach expressed in every feature of its glorious countenance, the heavenly vision of the crucified moved on. The doors of the abbey opened noiselessly, as though flung aside by invisible hands, admitting a broad shaft of winter moonlight from the outer air, and so never once looking back, it passed out and away from the crowded church of Christian worshippers, and melting into the silvery radiance of the moon, disappeared. The doors closed darkly behind it, and black shadows drooped from the dim cathedral arches, hanging drearily over the people and filling the aisles and chapels with a dull, noxious vapor. And then, with a sudden startling clangor, out rang the bells again. The bells, hoarse and reproachful, full of menace and foreboding, loneliness and despair. Such a tolling chime they gave us might fit for the burial of all the faiths and aspirations of the world. They spoke of death and not life, of the black grave from which all hope of resurrection had been taken. With a sob in their savage metal throats, they proclaimed the closing of the gates of heaven. With harsh resistance, they bewailed the loss of confidence in God, of trust in the future, of comfort in sorrow, and with dismal and heavy reverberations they thundered forth, Death! Death! Death is the end of all. There shall be no hereafter. Within the abbey, the people looked doubtfully at one another. Some smiled, some sighed. One or two had tears in their eyes. A faint whisper ran from lip to lip. Christmas Day, they murmured. It is Christmas Day, and again they sighed and smiled, but it was evident that the old festival for them held no meaning, no tender or pious memory. Once, perhaps, it might have had, but now, why now the very spirit and soul of Christmas had departed. The doors of the Christian church itself were closed against it. The divine friend of mankind had passed by unheeded, and had gone away from those who were passively permitting his honor to be assailed. What then was Christmas Day but the mere empty name of a discarded blessing? The dark shadows steadily thickened, and Josiah, still groveling on the ground with the awful clang of the moaning bells in his ears, felt that he was being stifled and pressed down into a tomb of everlasting icy cold, when he was suddenly plucked up from his knees by the grip of a too familiar claw, and lo, the goblin stood confronting him with a sad and sober grin. Dull place, Westminster Abbey, it remarked. Oh, hooroo! All damp and dismals. I wouldn't be an England's great man for anything. It's the last reward an England's great man ever gets. The honor, oh, hooroo, of being allowed to molder among the most moldered remains that ever moldered. Hooroo! I'm glad the body I used to wear when I was a church warden is all turned into daisies in a country churchyard. Pretty thing, daisies. Fancy your old wrinkles turning into them. McNason was silent. He stood quietly, resigned to the goblin's clutch, waiting for its next move. And while he waited, he saw the crowd in front of him sway, part asunder, and begin to disperse, while the atheist preacher descending from the pulpit held brief conversation with a man who took from his hand a roll of paper. McNason could hear him speaking, despite the space between them. "'Here's my sermon in full,' he said. "'I hope you will give it to the widest publicity.' 
the copy contains a good many effective bits which i was obliged to leave out with a mixed congregation you never know how people may take the upsetting of their cherished creeds in such work the press can do more than the pulpit nothing like a good press discussion for shaking the old foundations and i think my remarks are likely to cause a fluttering in the dovecotes the reporter for such he was smiled you are not afraid of your archbishop he said the atheist preacher laughed my archbishop he has no time to give his attention to any such matter as this he's too busy with the claims of the poor clergy they both laughed then shook hands and separated mcnason in the goblin's grasp watched them go their several ways and then suddenly recovering his speech said that man ought to be put out of the church quite right so he ought agreed the goblin you are getting quite discriminating josiah he ought to be put out of the church but who's going to do it he isn't drunk or disorderly he's a liar and a hypocrite and he's taking his salary on false pretenses but there are hundreds perhaps thousands like him besides those who live in a glass houses shouldn't throw stones you're as bad as he is in your way you pretend i have pretended said mcnason humbly the goblin looked at him and closed one round eye in a most horrible and portentous wink i see it observed you're preparing to make a good end you're like the naughty duchess oh what a character she was she went the pace as hard as ever she could till she was quite worn out and could count her crow's feet then she began to go to church regularly and became publicly charitable she turned herself into a bizarre lady opened several soup kitchens and used to cry over the newest sweet thing in curates naughty naughty duchess when she died an eminent dean preached a sermon about her she left him five thousand pounds in her will he said she was one of the noblest women that ever lived and she's one of us now oh hoo-hoo-roo. don't you try to be like her mcnason it doesn't pay come along come and take a look at london with a fantastic caper the goblin sidled and skipped out of the abbey its conical cap glowing like the flame of a will-o'-the-wisp in a dark morass while passively and without any strength to resist its imperious lead the millionaire followed in the full radiance of a moon which made the streets as light as day they presently stood and as in a fevered dream josiah saw the familiar clock tower of westminster the great square in front of the houses of parliament and the twinkling lamps on the bridge that spans the steely gleam of the river thames the dull human roar of the great metropolis thundered in his ears like the rushing of many waters and while he yet looked on the scene which he knew so well the goblin took off its cap and touched his eyes with its tasseled point tick-tock tick-tock only two thousand years by the spirit's clock it said and lo the stately tower buildings and streets disappeared smooth green fields spread out on every side full flowering with meadows sweet buttercups and daisies there was no longer any bridge across the river which flowing calmly between low banks of mossy turf and fern reflected the sunshine in a thousand sparkles and plashed against the double shores with musical murmurs of peace a flock of sheep grazed on the quiet pasture and their shepherd sat at his ease by the side of the placid stream and now the goblin waved its spidery arms ask him it said what has become of london obediently mcnason put the question the shepherd turned upon him a young wondering face london he echoed then he smiled oh yes i think i know what you mean there was a city of that name somewhere about here once but i don't know exactly where there's nothing of it left now nothing exclaimed mcnason aghast nothing and the goblin pronouncing this word waved its arms again whereupon the vision vanished nothing not a shred not a brick not a bone not even a gold coin all the business gone all the pleasure all the scheming plotting lying cheating villainy hatred and envy of one human creature contesting with the other gone all the self-sufficiency learning little wisdom and utter godlessness gone such will london be in two thousand years and nature will not miss it nature can do without it very well nature can do without you equally well mcnason the sun will go on shining and the birds will go on singing none the less because you are wanting come along come along in the spirit of one timothy two times up off we go on our last journey once more josiah fell on his knees spare me he cried 
spare me surely i have suffered enough suffered you o oh, beelzebub and the goblin began to elongate itself in his own peculiar and terror-striking style you've only just begun to know what it is to feel you hard old scoundrel you talk of suffering why you have lived till over sixty years of age caring nothing at all for the troubles of others unless you could turn such troubles to your own advantage as a child you were selfish as a boy you were selfish as a young man you were selfish as an old man you were selfish you have crushed out hundreds of human lives in your factories as if they were mere ants swarming under your iron heel you have cut down the expenses of your business to the narrowest meanest most pitiful margin you sweat your laborers to such an extent that you know you dare not walk through your own workshops without a revolver in your pocket and a man on either side of you for protection you are living curse to the majority of those you employ and they look for your death in the hope that after you are gone they will have a kinder master and you quote shakespeare do you and the bible a oh, hooroo come along time's up i tell you and we're not going far just a little seesaw ride to a home sweet home a last long home a happy home a oh, hooroo one timothy two and away we go end of section nine recording by elise black atlanta georgia Section 10 of The Strange Visitation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strange Visitation by Marie Corelli. Section 10. Again, a brief spell of semi-consciousness, a kind of waking nightmare in which many confused sights and sounds were intermingled flying visions of pale worn faces full of sorrow and appeal noises as of weeping with stifled cries and sobs of pain and then josiah mcnason opened his eyes widely to find himself lying flat on a narrow bed in the center of a rather large room his head rested on a small very hard pillow and on this pillow squatted the goblin with an air of being quite at ease here we are in a happy home mcnason it chuckled softly in his ear. Don't worry. Don't agitate yourself. Keep quite calm. You will have every possible attention. Josiah stared helplessly about him. He saw his clothes neatly folded and placed all together on the top of a chest of drawers. His top hat was also a particularly conspicuous object on a chair close by. He realized that he had been undressed and put to bed. But how this had happened, he could not tell. He turned a miserable, questioning gaze on the goblin. What? What's this? he stammered. What are you going to do to me? I, and the goblin, with an injured air of perfect innocence, executed a diabolical French shrug of its shoulders. I'm not going to do anything to you, my dear sir. I wouldn't be so cruel. It is they. They are going to do something to you but all for your good. Oh, hoo all for your good. They? Who were they? With painful hesitation, Josiah turned his eyes round about again and presently saw, standing near him, like dim figures in a blurred photograph, two men talking confidently together, one fairly young, the other elderly, while with them was a smart, well-set-up, rather perky-looking woman attired in the conventional gray gown spotless apron and cap of the professional nurse the elderly man's back was turned but he seemed to be expounding some knotty point of argument to his companions with particular emphasis and gusto something's gone wrong with the works mcnason said the goblin confidently that's what's the matter works and mcnason's troubled mind immediately reverted to his huge factories what works your works and the goblin leered at him sideways with a frightful grin your internal works and these two learned gentlemen are going to find out what it is you're ill you know you're very ill the learned gentlemen don't quite understand how or why you're ill but they're going to find out they're going to slice you up and see what you're like inside it will be most interesting and instructive to the learned gentlemen 
it won't interest you at all because you're to be put under chloroform and you won't know anything about it except when you come to. Then you will die, but that won't particularly matter. The operation is sure to be most successful. An operation is always successful, even if the patient never recovers. The medical profession must be safeguarded, you know. McNason heard and in an instant became a prey to the most violent access of nervous horror. I'm not ill, he said fiercely. There's nothing whatever the matter with me. How dare you say there is? It's all a mistake, an abominable mistake. I've never suffered from any illness except gout and indigestion. Never. There's no operation needed for such ailments. What the devil do you mean by bringing me here? You will talk about the devil. And the goblin shook its tasseled cap at him reproachfully. Don't say I mentioned him first. You're ill, I tell you. You're more seriously ill than your old friend Willie Dove. And you're here because you're ill. To this complexion must we come at last. Oh, Beelzebub, they don't know whether it's cancer or appendicitis with you. Look here, almost shouted Josiah, addressing himself to the two men who with the nurse still stood together talking, but who appeared not to hear him. Take me out of this place directly. I've been brought here on false pretenses. I'm not ill. I don't want an operation. I don't want to be operated upon. I'll, I'll... Here, exhausted, he sank back on his hard pillow, impotently clenching his hands in a paroxysm of rage and fear. The goblin grinned. Now, McNason, keep cool, it said. Don't show temper. Doctors don't like that sort of thing. They call it nerves, and they give you a soothing drought. Besides, these two eminent personages who are just now discussing your case can't hear you. And if they could, they wouldn't listen. One's a sir. He's a clever man, of course, or he wouldn't be a sir. It's a little unpleasant that the title puts him on the same rank with any provincial mayor who has presented an address to the sovereign. But it can't be helped. There's no suitable honor in this country for merely intellectual and scientific persons. Now, about your case. I've no case, groaned the wretched millionaire. No case at all. You are a case, declared the goblin, a whole case in yourself, a case of a man gone wrong, a case of a human creature who has a stone in the place of where his heart ought to be, a hard, heavy stone without a pulse of love or kindness in it. A case? Oh, Beelzebub, I should think you are a case. Sir Slasher cut him up, that's the broad-backed elderly gentleman over there, thinks you've got something malignant inside. Oh, who, roo, oo, oo. I should think you had. Sir Slasher believes it's cancer. But if it is, they'll never find it, McNason. No, your cancer's on the mind, and they'll never cut that out. But they're going to have a good try. Josiah moaned helplessly. Sir Slasher cut him up is a great vivisector, proceeded the goblin cheerfully. He knows where to find every little nerve and muscle in the body of a dog, for instance. I don't say your body is at all like that of a dog. I know your soul isn't half so honest or so faithful. Sir Slasher has had more than a hundred innocent animals under his scalpel, all poor, trustful, good creatures, whom he has pinned and stretched in every possible position on his rack of torture, whose nerves he has severed, whose muscles he has galvanized, and whom he has killed as slowly, as ruthlessly, and as criminally as any Torquemada that ever roasted a heretic to the sound of sacred music. Hooroo! Sir Slasher knows a thing or two, I can tell you. He's a licensed murderer of the harmless and helpless. But even a dog's soul has a place in the eternal countings, as Sir Slasher may find out to his cost, when he becomes a member of our United Emperor Club. He cut up a dog yesterday. Now he's going to cut up you. You're a splendid subject for him, you know. You've got so much money. Again, Josiah moaned in a stupor of fear. You've got so much money, repeated the goblin, smacking its wide lips as though it were tasting something savory. And money's a great thing. Money has enabled you to come to this home, 
one of the most select homes in London. Oh, home, sweet home. Oh, happy, happy home. It's the special pet nursing home of Sir Slasher cut -em up where he's got the matron and all the nurses under his big thumb. Oh, hoo such a dear home. You pay five guineas a week for your room to begin with, and then when you're very sick, you pay ten. Afterwards, when you get worse and are likely to die, you pay fifteen. The nurse is extra. If you have two nurses, you have two extras. Everything apart from the room and the bed is extra. If you want a bottle of soda water, you pay sixpence for a split, nine pence for a full, and so on, and so on. Oh, what a dear, comfy home. There aren't many like it in London, I can tell you. Only a few beautiful, blessed few. At this moment, the personage whom the goblin designated as Sir Slasher cut him up finished his conversation with his younger colleague, and both gentlemen smiled pleasantly, not to say flirtatiously, at the grey-gowned nurse. Twelve o'clock tomorrow will do very well, said Sir Slasher. We shall leave you to make all the preliminary arrangements, Nurse Dratamal. He's asleep just now, I see. I'm not asleep, gurgled McNason feebly. But Sir Slasher apparently did not hear. He stood by the bedside, smiling blandly, his hands clasped behind him under his coattails. One of the richest men in the world, he ejaculated appreciatively. Dear me, dear me. Oh, well, well. Has he any family? None, said Nurse Dratamal. He had one son, I believe, who died in childhood. She spoke primly, her lips opening and shutting on her words like a kind of mechanical valve. But while she spoke, she flashed her eyes at the younger doctor with a feline cajolery in their hard brown depths. Then who, murmured Sir Slasher, thoughtfully, who is to carry on his vast business concerns? Who is to inherit his enormous fortune? No answer was forthcoming to this profound proposition. Sir Slasher thereupon removed his hands from under his coattails and consulted his watch. I must be going, he said. You will attend to all that is necessary, nurse. Certainly, Sir Slasher. I shall bring Dr. Chokum off with me tomorrow. And I think, yes, I think, here he looked benevolently considerate, that taking into account Mr. McNason's great wealth and important position and... Er, also, er, the very difficulty and uncertainty of the operation, Dr. Chokomoff's fee should be doubled. He is one of our best anesthetists. What do you say, nurse? Sir Slasher had a delightful smile, and he was smiling delightfully now. Nurse Dratamal responded to the charm of it. There is no doubt that it is justifiably a case of double fees all round, she said, her own smile breaking into a giggle. Exactly and Sir Slasher shed a fatherly glance upon her. And our young friend here, at this he laid a hand on his fellow surgeon's shoulder, our young and brilliant friend will also have an opportunity of displaying his skill in securing his reward. Of course, here he became portentously businesslike. It will be advisable to get the patient to sign the required checks in advance. There will be no difficulty about what I should imagine, because you see... Afterwards, ah, afterwards, echoed the younger doctor, speaking for the first time. Sir Slasher tried to look grave, but failed in the attempt. Afterwards, he said pleasantly, the worthy millionaire may not be in a condition to sign anything. I think, and he paused, stroking his smooth double chin, I think, nurse, he should be told that the operation is a grave, very grave one. In case, these things sometimes happen in case he has not made a will, or, let us say, in case he might wish to make some last testamentary gift to, er, uh, to me, or, or to you, or to anyone else who may have rendered him a service. I'll see that he does all that he ought to do, said Nurse Dratamal, with some severity. I like my patients to be prepared for the worst. Quite right, quite right, murmured Sir Slasher, but prepare him gently, quite gently, nurse, by degrees and cautiously. I have known cases where patients getting too much alarmed have made their escape from a home like this by jumping out of the window. And strange to say they have, some of them escaped uninjured. And stranger still, 
They have recovered and lived many years, most curious and remarkable. But nerves are unaccountable things. Here he paused and looked again at McNason. He sleeps very soundly. I should say he was older than he admits. Oh, well, well, we shall see. But I very much fear there's no chance for his recovery. Then why not spare the knife and let him live as long as nature will allow him? asked the younger doctor suddenly. Sir Slasher looked amazed and reproachful. My dear sir, I was called in by Mr. McNason, and I must do my best for such a very wealthy man. Besides, I think his is a very complex case, and likely to prove most helpful and instructive. Tomorrow at twelve o'clock, nurse. Good evening. End of section 10「Section 11 of The Strange Visitation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strange Visitation by Marie Corelli. Section 11. And Sir Slasher cut him up, walked softly out of the room, followed by his colleague. Nurse Dratimal, with a casual glance at the bed, where Josiah McNason lay, settled her cap more coquettishly on her head and tripped after them. They're gone, said the goblin then, sliding down from the pillow and sitting astride on Josiah's recumbent body, but Nurse Dratimal will soon be back. I don't want her back, groaned McNason, making an attempt to draw up the bed quilt in order to cover his eyes, in which effort he did not succeed. I don't want anything. Leave me alone. Sorry. I can't oblige you, replied the goblin. I can't leave you alone until you leave yourself alone. And Nurse Dratimal must come back to attend to her duties. She's got a lot of things to do to you. McNason peered over the extreme edge of the bed quilt. A lot of things to do to me? He echoed whimperingly. What, what will she do? She will wash you first, said the goblin briskly all over oh such a nice wash made of carbolic disinfectant and you will be so clean outside you josiah closed his eyes shudderingly and then you will be put into a new flannel nightshirt went on the goblin and you will perhaps be allowed a cup of hot milk or beef tea and when you're nice and warm and clean and cozy nurse dratimal will come and tell you to prepare for your end no, no, cried McNason. I'm not ill, and I'm not ready. You are ill, declared the goblin firmly, and never mind about not being ready for your end. Nurse Dratimal will make you ready. She'll tell you what a very serious and expensive matter it will be to slice you up scientifically tomorrow, and she will ask you where your checkbook is. I won't tell her. I won't, shuddered McNason. Oh, yes, you will. She'll get it out of you, and then you'll write a big check for Sir Slasher Cut-Em-Up, and another for the matron of this happy home, and for Dr. Chokomoff, and for everyone else who wants a fee for sending you into the next world, and then, then you'll be allowed to sleep if you can, and tomorrow, tomorrow. Here the goblin paused. Josiah raised himself up on his hard pillow and looked at it with appealing eyes. Not so very long ago, it went on presently, in a kind of sing-song monotone, a man I knew went to a home, something like this, only not quite so up-to-date and expensive. He was a bold, kindly, genial creature, fond of life and life's pleasures. Something went wrong with him, and he consulted the doctors. They told him he had an internal ailment, but they could not tell whether it was malignant or not, till they had, so to speak, opened him up. He felt strong and hopeful, and consented to the operation. The surgeons did their work, and how they did it, of course, only they could tell. But it was, according to their own report, successful. In forty-eight hours, the warm-blooded personality of the man that had talked, smiled, and jested with his own danger was a mere lump of cold, stiff clay. He had relatives, oh yes, he had children for whom he had worked all of his life. What did they do? 
why they allowed his body, which had so lately pulsated with love for them all, to be taken away from the home in which he died, and laid in a dismal vault without a single soul to keep watch by it at night or say a prayer. The world is growing callous concerning the dead, you know, and they don't keep corpses in homes. When a man dies under an operation, he must be removed by his family at once. In this case, the poor fellow was removed to a chilly city mortuary. His children, warm and comfortable, ate food as usual and discussed the funeral business. Down in the cold and darkness lay the once animated, cheery, generous-hearted man, alone, all, all alone, shut out from the movement and the light of natural things, with no loving eyes to keep watch by his mortal remains, no tender hands to lay flowers on his lifeless breast, and yet sentimentalists talk about family love and home affections. Oh, hoo And the goblin actually had tears like sparks of fiery dew in his eyes. You ought to be glad you've got no children, McNason. You've got money instead, and money will enable you to have your body carried home grandly to your country seat by special train. You can be laid out in state if you like, provided you give the order before Sir Slasher cut him up arrives tomorrow. Candles burning all around you and wreaths on your coffin. And it's all done for money. And you can have a most expensive funeral, a beautiful mausoleum, a marble monument, and a lying epithet. All for money. Money's a great thing. Magnason. And you've got it. Oh, Beelzebub, you've got it. But you've got nothing else. At this juncture, Magnason suddenly sat up in bed. Yes, I have, he said, with a kind of trembling eagerness. I've got something else. I've got you. And I want, I want to make a friend of you. The goblin opened its round eyes so wide that they threatened to fall out. Oh, you do, do you? It queried doubtfully. That's odd. Now what put that into your head? I don't know. I don't know, stammered McNason agitatedly. But I think... I feel you don't really want to do me any harm. Look here. Get me out of this. Take me away. Take me away. Take me home. The goblin took off its conical cap and examined the interior of that headgear with critical gravity. Its hair, in the all-round style, seemed blacker and stickier than ever, and its features worked into the most alarming contortions. Take you home, it echoed. What? Before Nurse Dratamal comes back? Yes, yes and Josiah wrung his hands imploringly. Take me away at once. But you're ill, said the goblin. You're very ill. I'm not. You are. You've got a cancer. I haven't. You have. It's called selfishness. It's eating your life away, poisoning your blood, rotting your soul. I'll get rid of it. I'll, I'll cut it out myself. And in his excitement, McNason caught hold of the goblin's claw and pressed it fervently. I will, I will. Only take me out of this. Give me a chance. You're feverish, too, continued the goblin severely. Your temperature has gone up to the very highest point of fraudulent philanthropy. I know, I know, but it will all be right. Only let me get home, and you shall see, you shall see. Here his voice ebbed away into a kind of choked sob. And I'm not sure that you haven't got eczema, pursued the goblin. Your snobbish hankering after a peerage will probably break out in a rash all over you. It won't, said McNason. It shan't. I'll, I'll do whatever you tell me. Oh, will you really, though? And the goblin sniffed the air with his terribly plastic nose very dubiously. Do you mean it? Or is it all a funk? And only because you want to get away from Sir Slasher cut him up? I don't believe in deathbed repentances. It's not. It's not a deathbed repentance, well, McNason. I don't want this to be my deathbed. I want to die in my own home. Ah, so does Willie Dove, said the goblin. Perhaps you can understand now why his wife doesn't want to send him to a hospital. McNason shuddered. Time was flying fast, he thought. And that cruel-looking nurse Dratamal would be coming back immediately and with an imploring cry he held out his arms to the goblin. Ah, be good to me, he moaned. Take me home. I'll promise anything, anything. It's easy to promise, said the goblin. Anyone can do that. 
But will you keep your promises? For instance, will you think of some other few things besides yourself? McNason lifted his trembling hands in the fashion of one invoking the gods. I will, I will. You are a man of money, pursued the goblin, and with all the money you possess, will you think of poverty, of the thousands and thousands of human beings made of the same flesh and blood as yourself, who perish every year for lack of food, of infants starving, of patient genius toiling for mere pence, of delicate women working their lives away in order to provide sustenance for their children? Will you think of all these things and help them when you can, not grudgingly nor patronizingly, but with a full heart and a generous spirit? Faintly, as a bride at the altar, McNason murmured, I will. You are a man of luxury, went on the goblin. Will you think of crime? Of the woeful sins which wretched men are driven to commit through want and misery? Of the prisons crowded with branded human creatures who in nine cases out of ten owe their guilt to the evil persuasions of others more cunning, more treacherous, and powerful than themselves? of unhappy mothers gone mad with despair who have murdered their children rather than see them die of hunger of girls once innocent betrayed ruined and deserted by the villainy and cruelty of such devils in the shape of men that even hell might close its doors against them will you think of crime and thinking of it will you remember that it is often the sight of a man like you over prosperous over proud that helps to drive the poor into the labyrinths of envy, hatred, drink, murder, and suicide. Will you think of crime, and do your best to fight against it with all of your influence, all your power, and all your money? And at this juncture, the goblin looked positively terrific. McNason quailed before its gorgon eyes and shivered. I, I will try, he murmured. The goblin rose on its skeleton toes and lifted its skeleton arms. Its voice grew loud and shrill. You are a man of commerce and calculation, it said. Will you think of war? Think of a nation rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom. The beginning of sorrows. Think of widows and orphans. Think of thousands of dying and dead men. Of human blood springing hot to heaven and clamoring for vengeance of burning cities and wrecked ships. Hark! Listen to the rush of waters and the roll of guns. And now, as the goblin spoke, there came a distant booming sound upon the air, mingled with the measured tramp of many marching feet and hundreds of male voices strongly uplifted in defiant chorus. We sweep the seas, our glorious flag unfurled, from north to south, from east to west, shines o'er the world. Our cannon's bellowing thunder roars with the roaring waves, for Britain's foes wild ocean holds nothing but graves. We sweep the seas on waters far and near, our signals flash and write in fire our meanings clear. No other land, no other race can match our British men. They've won a thousand fights before, they'll win again. We sweep the seas, we rule the restless foam, we struggle not for place or pelf, we fight for home. Loud let the shout of victory ring on the favoring breeze, down with the foe ten fathoms deep, we sweep the seas. War, said the goblin, tossing its arms wildly as the sounds died away. War, accursed yet triumphant. War. Think of it, you with your millions, can you... Will you think of it without speculating in the widespread misery it involves? Without making more money on the traffic in blood? Without lending yourself and your wealth to wicked contracts by which you steal from your country's government and line your own pockets? Can you be true to the land in which you live? Can you, will you boldly refuse to sell material assistance for your own personal advantage to your country's foes? Lashed into a fit of nervous desperation, McNason almost shouted, I can, I can, and I will. Whereupon the goblin put on its conical cap. You are coming around, McNason, it observed encouragingly. You are really coming round. I think you are better. Your temperature is lower, nearer the normal principle. 
Principle is an excellent pulse. It's firm and steady and keeps the whole body going wholesomely. Very few have it nowadays, and as a natural consequence, the statistics of insane and diseased persons show an alarming increase. Now, this an oblique but not unfriendly leer, are you sure you feel well enough to go home? Sure, sure, and Josiah began to scramble out of bed in his excitement. I'll get my clothes on in a minute. Won't you wait for Nurse Dratamal? suggested the goblin with a chuckle. She'll be back directly. No, no, no. Here his voice faltered and died away as he discovered, to his terror, that he had no power to put his feet to the floor, nor could he reach his clothes. Oh, I'm so helpless, he wailed, so feeble and helpless. Oh, dear, oh, dear, what shall I do? Have a split soda, said the goblin. In this dear sweet home, it's only sixpence. But if you put a bee in it, it's two shillings. Half mad with impatience, Josiah wriggled about in the bed, turning his imploring eyes on the rentless goblin, who, perched on the quilt, was beginning to elongate itself in the most leisurely manner. I suppose you want to keep Christmas now, it remarked presently, and you're in a hurry to begin. Is that it? Yes, yes, that's it, stuttered Josiah. You'll take me, won't you? You'll take me. The goblin waved its claw, and in another instant Josiah Magnason stood erect, fully clothed, gazing fearfully up, up ever so high, at the indescribable face and form which now loomed like a monstrous bat above him. So tall had it suddenly grown, and so thin. So terrible were its goggle eyes, so enigmatical its wide grin, that anxious as it was to depart from his present place of torture, he shook like a leaf in a stiff breeze at the prospect of another airship voyage with such a fearsome skipper of the winds. One Timothy two, said the goblin, and its voice seemed to fall from some magical pinnacle reared miles above the clouds. One Timothy two, grace, mercy, peace, time to keep Christmas, Christmas day and Christmas bells. Come along, come along, home for the holidays, off we go. Stooping forward like a giant cloud from the sky, the goblin whisked off the shrinking, shuddering millionaire as easily as a gust of wind whisked off the broken branch of a tree, and spreading its great wings, whirled with a wild hoo-roo-oo-oo -oo, out into the starry spaces of the night. End of section 11「Section 12 of The Strange Visitation – this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. The Strange Visitation by Marie Corelli, Section 12. Now came soft pauses of silence, flashing gleams of color like broken rainbows floating at will through the pure ether, glimpses of clear sky wherein the greater planets shone gloriously, resembling revolving lights set in the watch-towers of heaven, straying films of pearly vapor through which the moon peered fitfully with a doubtful brilliancy, then, lo, the dear, familiar earth, lifting its dark rim against the pale blue reaches of the morning, and then the sun, warm with its golden heart's effulgence, a splendid orb of life and health and beauty rose in a flood of glory over the mountain tops and over the seas, spreading radiance on the wintry fields, illumining the leafless trees, and deepening to a more vivid scarlet the berries of the thick green holly and the dainty feathers on the breasts of the robins. And the bells! Oh, the bells! How they rang! how they sang in all the turrets and steeples of every church that lifted its shining spire to the sunshine. Peace, goodwill, peace, goodwill, they seemed to say over and over again with such a gladness and a thankfulness in their soft chiming as made the heart grow full of tenderness and tears. And now, all suddenly, a tremulous little chorus of small, fresh voices began to mingle with the bell's sweet tune. God rest you, merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. 
Remember Christ our Saviour was born on Christmas Day. Then came a pause, a murmur, and again the quaint old melody began. God rest you, merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Uttering a smothered cry, Josiah McNason started to his feet. What? What was this? Where was he? Wildly he stared about him, and then with a kind of hysterical shout recognized his surroundings. I'm at home, he cried. At home, in my own house, in my own room, thank God. Pressing his hands to his forehead, he gazed bewilderedly at every familiar object. There was his desk, his armchair. He seemed to have just sprung out of that chair. The fireplace, where now there was no fire but only a heap of white ashes in the grate. The telephone. Ah, that telephone! His papers, books, letters, ink, pens, ledgers, and a checkbook. On this last object his eyes rested meditatively. It was a dream, he muttered. A horrible, horrible dream. Nothing else. It was a dream. It wasn't. The answer came as sharply and with remarkable emphasis. Josiah trembled violently. He was not yet alone then. A sudden thought struck him and a light came into his eyes. A light new and strange that gave them quite a youthful sparkle. At any rate, he said, I'll be before Pitt this time. I'll, I'll cut him out. And sitting down at his desk, he drew pen and paper to his aid and wrote the following. My dear sir, I am exceedingly sorry to hear of your precarious condition of health, especially when I recall the strength and activity which used to distinguish you so greatly at one time when you did such excellent work for the firm. I understand from my overseer, Mr. Pitt, that a couple of hundred pounds will be useful to you at this particular juncture, and I have much pleasure in enclosing you a check for that amount as a slight testimony of my great appreciation of your former faithful services. Trusting you will pull through your illness, and assuring you of the great satisfaction it gives me to be of assistance to you in a time of need, believe me, with best wishes for a pleasant Christmas, yours obliged and sincerely, Josiah McNason. Taking his checkbook, he wrote the required formula that two hundred pounds should be paid to William Dove or order, and signed his name, Josiah McNason, with a free, proud dash under the signature that made it even more characteristic than usual. Putting letter and check in an envelope, he sealed and addressed it to William Dove Esquire, and enclosed the whole packet in another envelope with a few words addressed to Mr. Pitt. "'I think,' he said then with a bland, almost smiling air, "'that will do for Mr. Pitt. Mr. Pitt will find himself out of court this time.' He got up from his desk and stood irresolute. Then he rang his bell. "'This must be taken by special messenger,' he said. "'There's no late post on Christmas Day.' He smiled and rubbed his hands. At that instant the door opened, and his servant Towler appeared with a pale, rather scared face. "'Good morning, Towler.' "'Good morning, sir. Glad to see you well, sir.' "'Glad to see me well. Have I been ill, then?' "'No, sir. At least I hope not, sir. But I went to call you at seven o'clock, as you told me, sir, and you weren't in your room, and your bed hadn't been slept in, and uh, I, er, uh, didn't know what to think, sir. I didn't dare to come in here.' "'I was busy,' said Josiah calmly. "'Very busy. Tremendously busy all night. What time is it now?' Nine o'clock, sir. And it's Christmas Day, isn't it? Yes, sir. Here's a sovereign for you. 
and McNason handed that coin to his astonished retainer. "'And just get someone to take this letter to Mr. Pitt's house at once. It's important.' "'Yes, sir. Certainly, sir. Thank you, sir. A Merry Christmas to you, sir.' "'Thank you. Same to you.' Backing deferentially out of his master's presence, Teller ran downstairs as fast as he could into the servants' hall, there announcing that, "'Something's happened to the governor. He's too pleasant to last.' And Macnason, still standing thoughtfully by his desk, repeated again in an undertone, "'It was a dream. It must have been a dream.' "'It wasn't!' And a shrill falsetto voice rang clear on the silence. don't you dare to call me a dream and with a violent shock of renewed terror macnason saw poised between him and the sunlight which poured through the windows the goblin shrunk in size to the smallest quaintest creature possible holding over its strangely shaped head a sprig of holly exactly as a man holds an open umbrella i'm going it said but don't you be such a fool as to think yourself a something and me a nothing you'll make an awful mistake if you do i'm sorry said macnason humbly i don't want to make any more mistakes you'd better not said the goblin and its form began to grow more vague and indistinct you've got the chance you asked for but if you lose it now i won't what would you like to think was only a dream is a supernatural reality went on the goblin it has all happened or it will happen if you don't take care if your mind breeds disease so will your body and sir slasher will have to be called in and if he's once called in you will be called out Macnason shuddered, but was silent. "'You've begun to keep Christmas in the proper way for the first time in your life.' And the goblin's voice grew fainter and fainter. "'But if you don't go on keeping it—' "'I will,' cried Josiah eagerly. "'I will.' "'In the spirit of one Timothy, too.' "'I will.' "'Grace—' mercy peace the words floated on the air like a breath and then the goblin turned its back and began to trot slowly away under its holly sunshade smaller and smaller it grew till it looked no bigger than a tiny christmas doll on a christmas tree and then all at once a shining tangle of golden curls and a glitter of sparkling eyes flashed against the window a semicircle of children pressed their round rosy faces close to the panes and again began to sing god rest you merry gentlemen let nothing you dismay remember christ our saviour was born on christmas day whereat the great josiah macnason multi-millionaire laughed actually laughed going to the window he threw it open and putting a hand into his pocket, he took out a bunch of silver. "'Hello, youngsters!' he cried. "'Christmas morning, eh? Here you are!' And out flew three pences, six pences, and shillings in a shower. "'Fair play!' he exclaimed. "'Equal profits! Don't trample one on the other. Girls first, boys next. The strong must help the weak!' that's right all good friends together all happy no envy no jealousy all peace and good will a merry christmas merry christmas merry christmas shouted the astonished children as jumping for joy they gathered up their gifts merry christmas lisped a small boy with a flaxen head sturdily clambering up to the window from the lawn a couple of feet below and looking boldly in the face of the world's celebrated rich man 
God bless you. And the rich man answered gently, God bless you, little man. Then the whole group of young folks, determined to do the best they could for what they had received, burst out again in lusty chorus. God rest you, merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day. And Josiah McNason, listening quietly, while the old carol was sung through, saw as he gazed beyond the children's faces into the Christmas morning sunshine, a tiny shape slowly disappearing into space, a shape so delicate as to seem no more than one of the sunbeams, while a voice, fine and far, yet clear as a flute, said, Remember. I will, he answered, under his breath. In the spirit of one Timothy too, good-bye, whispered the goblin. Grace, mercy, peace. And Christmas Day, said Josiah, I shall remember. The End End of Section 12 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia End of The Strange Visitation by Marie Corelli